morning. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. So let's pick up from where we stopped uh, the last class. Last class, we looked at chapter six, chapter seven. We looked at about revelation. Yes, we looked at the illumination that God gives us. Um, we looked at also the human spirit and how God speaks to us through our spirit. Um, there are different containers. There's our conscience. There is our, our knowing, our communion, um, our identity, our action. And uh, we looked at how revelation is important to grow in the knowledge and the will of God. Okay, so let's get into chapter two. Are you want to reduce the volume on the house here? Okay, chapter two is new creation in Christ. Now, we've already talked about what it is, what it means to be a new creation, right? Our our old self is gone. We are a new person, a new being. So let's look at uh, what. More we can learn from this. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen and eighteen. Right. So one of us can please read that. Second Corinthians five seventeen and eighteen. Therefore, if anyone in is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has recall. Reconciled, reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reco reconciliation. Right? Reconciliation. So, now again, the Apostle Paul is writing here to the Corinthians, and he's emphasizing the privilege that you and I have with our new identity in Christ. He says, therefore, if anyone... So he's emphasizing on the word anyone here. It can be any language, any culture, any race, any gender. Anyone is in Christ. He's a new creation. So this invitation of being in Christ is given to each and every one of us. Everyone in this world. So anybody in this world whether he's the richest or the poorest, whether he's the most honest person or the most dishonest person, whether he's the worst criminal that has ever lived on the face of the earth, if they come to the cross and if they believe in the Lord Jesus, what does it say here? He is a new creation. Old things will pass away. All things become new. So this invitation is open for everyone at any time for any reason any purpose you have you can enter and receive this communion this wonderful union that we have in christ and this is freely given the best part is we don't have to come in by works we don't have to say, God, I am filled with sin, I'm, I'm jealous, I'm angry, and I've done so many wrong things in the past. Is there a place for forgiveness for me? We don't have to come that way. Because if anyone is in Christ, it is the grace and the mercy of God. Right? So we're not coming by our own works. Nor can we say, God, I've I've read the whole Bible. I have, you know, I have given to the poor. I have, you know, tried to live a holy life. So now will you accept me? Even that is wrong. You understand what I'm saying? There are, you can't have these two extremes. A criminal cannot say, oh, I'm, a, I'm the worst person. There's no forgiveness for me and stay away. Nor can a righteous man pretend to say, okay, I've, I've, I've learned everything, I know everything, I give to the poor, I've been holy, I try to help my friends. Nor can he come into the presence of God by his own ability. Because to become a new creation, you and I have to enter his presence by his grace. How many of you have heard that song? Into thy presence I come, not by the works that I have done. But by your grace alone, I come and bow before your throne. 
So it's, it's not the works. Not at all. Yes, Paul writes later on in this uh, uh, chapter, and he says, rewards are different. right? We will be rewarded for what we have done. But we all enter through the same blood of Jesus, through the same grace. right? Whether it is the Apostle Paul, or whether it is a believer who is you know, one month in the Lord, both of them enter the same way, the blood of Jesus. That is called grace. right? So no one is without hope. This opportunity to change up your own life is open to anybody. So we're learning in lifestyle evangelism, when you preach the gospel, you're giving them an invitation to become a new creation. Imagine this, if somebody accepts the Lord Jesus, the old self is gone. They don't have to come by their works, or all their sin, the list that they have. They don't have to come in all that. Just come in by the grace of God. Again, Paul writes later on, and he says, we don't take the grace of God for granted. Right? Oh, OK, God's grace, God's grace. Do whatever we feel like. No. Because when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old things have passed away. It, it does not come back again. Paul writes, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that I'm living, but Christ living it inside of me. So if you still find yourself living by the old nature, right, after becoming believers, if you still find yourself living through the old nature, always being crowded with thoughts or, or whatever it is, uh, it could be anger, jealousy, pride, whatever it is, if you find yourself in that place, go back to the cross. Go back to the cross and go back and say, God, I want to receive forgiveness. Never come to a place where we know everything. Right? Never come to that place. No one is without hope, regardless of whether we are spiritual, whether how desperate we are, whether how hopeless we are, how miserable we may be, when we enter God's presence. God's grace is available. Let me give you this example. There's this book that I read. Forget the name of the book, but I remember the inc incidents, right? So in this book, it, it is an article about a prison. This is in the early 1990s. An article about Angola prison in the, in the United States of America. Angola prison was the most dangerous prison in the world. Nobody wants to go there. The police officers were scared to work there, right? So very few people will work because the prison inmates were so dangerous they could kill anyone. Right? So people, the, even the police officers were fearful for their lives, right? But this middle-aged policeman, he was a believer. So he took it up as a challenge, right? He went and he said, "Okay, I will go to Angola prison." And I will handle everything in that place. Just give me a few officers, but I will make sure everything is OK. You know, now he had a family, he had children. But he said, I'm going to see the work of God in that place. I want to see God working. So he went there. All his family members and his, uh, you know, his colleagues said, don't go. It's very dangerous. You're a young man. You've got your life ahead of you. But he took up this challenge, and he went. And what did he do? He, he took up Bibles and he put it all across in each and every room of the, of the cell. Right? So there were about 300 to 350 inmates. Each and every room he placed Bibles. He placed scripture verses everywhere on the walls. Right? And he would stand in the middle of those, you know, you have this common area in prisons. So he would stand there and he would pray loudly. Now he's a police officers so nobody can stop him so he would pray and what he noticed was these prison guards these the inmates would tear the bible pages and they would use it for drugs they would smoke or they would burn it and they would use it as toilet paper right but he was very sad when he saw all of this but 
what happened was over time, one or two of them in their cells, they accepted the Lord Jesus. How? One person, he tore a page from the Bible and he was going to use it as paper to do drugs. So as he was rolling that, he saw a verse and he just read it. The verse was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only because he read it and he began to cry. He began to weep. God loved the world so much that he gave his son for me. And he, right then and there, he gave his life to Christ. One person. Now, what they did was this police officer and that man would sit together and have Bible study. Slowly, many others started, you know, accepting the Lord Jesus. People started you know, coming and hearing the Bible study times. There came a time after a couple of years, the Bible study in the church, in the, in the prison, 300 to 400, all of them would sit there. There came a time when, uh, you know, this man would invite pastors and churches to come to the church, come to the prison to have worship and word. And these are all criminals who are there for life sentence. They're all murderers. And they were worshipping God. They are there for Bible study. They are making notes during Bible study. And a couple of years later, Angola prison became the safest prison in the world. Safest prison in the world. You want to live, go and stay in Angola prison. Right? You see what happened here? Did they change their appearance? They were still big, built, tattooed everywhere. But they became a new creation. All of a sudden, when they saw people, it was not anger, hatred, or you know, wanting to murder them. There was a new person inside. There was love. It became the safest prison. You know, many of them were incarcerated, meaning they had to be killed, right? They were, uh, they had to be like on death row. So they either the electric chair or they were hung. And so during the last, you know, this, this is the testimony. When you read the book, you'll, it's really interesting. They would take the people to the place where they're going to be executed. And as they were going, they will sing hymns and singing songs of rejoicing. And they would say, oh, I'm going to meet my father in heaven now. I know my sins are washed away. I know I'm washed by the blood of Jesus. Now I'm going to meet the Lord Jesus. There was no fear. There was no weeping, there was no crying, but there was joy. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Right? So we can all experience this life. And the best part is, right now, Jesus is sitting on his throne of grace. Do we make mistakes? But we can go into his presence, go back and say, Lord Jesus, give me the grace to do what you have called me to do. Give me the strength. Change me, melt me, mold me. Make me the person that you want me to be. And that identity changes. Our, our spirit changes inside us, right? So let's go into chapter 10. We all have a new life from above. Now, in the book of John, Nicodemus comes and talks to Jesus. Nicodemus was a, a teacher of the law, right? And in this portion, he asked the Lord Jesus a very, very important yet a critical question, right? So let's read that. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. Any one of us can please read. John chapter 3, 1 to 8. Uh, John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Mostly assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Mostly assured, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit do not marvel that i said to you you must be born again the uh, wind blows where it wishes and and you hear the sound of the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the spirit right now see we must understand this right now we understand what it, it means to be born again right we we understand but when nicodemus during that time Right? When, when he meets with Jesus, he asks this question. This man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher, for no one does these signs and wonders. Jesus answered and said, I say to you, unless one is born again. Now, Nicodemus must have heard these two words for the first time. Unless one is born again. Now, you and I use it. But in the old covenant, there is no born again. There's no born again. There's born and death. So what is this born again? So the ruler of, he's a ruler. He's a ruler of the Jews. So he's asking Jesus, sinking in the natural again. Jesus, I'm already born. I'm waiting for my death. But how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Right. That's a simple question. Right, it, But it was a natural question. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So there he's talking about your body. Nicodemus, your body is flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's ask, answering his question there. Now, in, in some of the translations, the word born again means from above. It is made anew. Right? Uh, how many of you know what's a makeover? Right? Uh, you take a person, a rugged, bad-looking person. He's got all scratches and he's got a you know, very bad beard and he's not been looked after properly. You take this man, you put him and you say, you call a designer or fashion designer or whatever, you put him and you say, okay, give him a makeover. So they're going to nicely, you know, give him a good cut and then make him look all fresh. And then all of a sudden, they'll have the old photo and the new photo. Same person, now he's got a makeover. Now Jesus did not do that. He didn't give us a makeover. Right? He didn't give us, a, he didn't take our old self and say, okay, from this old self, I'll make a new self. No. The Bible says, when you are born again, doesn't mean we die and we are born again, not that. Our spirit is born again. We're no longer the old spirit. It's not like Jesus took that old spirit, did some makeover, and now we are new. No. We have a new spirit. The spirit of a new creation, right? To be born again means to be born from above. That is, to be born of the spirit and the old spiritual, the old spirit is gone away. It's not there anymore. Now, very important. As believers, you and I have the choice. We can say, okay, I want to, I want to, work or function from the old spirit or i can say no i want to function in the new spirit get what i'm saying right we have the choice but jesus is saying you've been born again from heaven so the moment you said jesus come into my life make me a new person you know that old spirit yes the old spirit you had angry Wanting to fight, bad habits, jealousy, you know, those old habits, that's all gone. The old person, the old spirit is gone. Become a new person. Okay? So we must understand. See, you and I, we are, what are we? What are we? We are spirit beings. Right? 
we are spirit beings. We, the spirit has a soul, that is a mind, will, emotions. And we live in a body. So this body is temporary. Right? After we die, we'll become skeleton. Right? This body, you, there's no use of soap and uh, all of those things after we're dead. Why is it that when somebody dies, they'll say, when is the body coming? Your name also is not relevant. Have you noticed that? Mm. Will they say, when is, your, when is David coming? No, they'll say, when is the body coming? Because your name itself is not relevant. You're just a body. But the spirit lives on. The spirit inside has mind, will, emotions. Right? Now, when we go to heaven, we will experience the joy of heaven. The spirit will be there. When we go to, if we don't go to heaven, if we are on the other side of heaven, what will happen? The spirit will experience the fire. Right? So, so our bodies are just a vessel that God has given us. Spirit is what matters. Right? Our life can go in a blink of an eye. And I'm not making you all scared. But the truth hurts. It is truth. <laughs> right? Body will go. But the spirit remains. Our spirit will... The Bible says, Jesus says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Present. So, when you and I are born again, when and how does it happen? The moment you become believers. The moment we say, Jesus, come into my life. That old spirit is just moved off and the new spirit comes in. Now, the old spirit wants to drink alcohol, wants to smoke, wants to do drugs, wants to live in sexual immor immorality. That's the old spirit. Anger, jealousy, fighting, all of that. Now, suddenly, you're the same person. Same hairstyle. Same, you look the same. No angel has come and changed you. You look the same. But all of a sudden, the mind is thinking of other things. Oh, how can I learn more about God? How can I spend more time in prayer? How can I learn how to worship God? Same person. What is the difference? Two differences. Right? When I'll just share a little bit about what happened to me. When I was 18 years old, or 18 years old, I overdosed on drugs. The doctor said, you're going to die in six months. I said, OK, I'm ready. Everything was focused on drug addiction. When can I get my next drug? When can I do what I have to do? I didn't care about God. God was the last thing in my mind. It was all about drugs. That's all I wanted. Drugs and music, two things. That's all what's mattered to my, in my life. The moment a new person comes in, the Holy Spirit comes in, become a new person. I, I realized, hey, all the thinking about drugs, about you know, rock and roll and the music and all of it, everything has changed. Now I don't, I don't even feel like doing drugs. So what I began to do, I started opening the Bible. I didn't understand anything. But just read somewhere, just try to pray. What, what happened? For five and a half years, I was doing drugs. The doctor said, you're going to die in six months. Here, with a new spirit, everything changes. Our thinking changes. The Spirit of God is able to make a person into a new person. And this invitation is open to all of us. Right? It's open to all of us. Similarly, when, you know, when we experience new life, we know that it has happened in, inside of us. Now, it, there may be different expressions when God speaks to us. You know, all of us, God has spoken to us. Right? When you accepted the Lord, some of you must have cried. We, must, we may have feel joyful. We may have, you know, 
felt a conviction of the Holy Spirit, something, right? We would have felt something, but it does not, we, we, it's not about a feeling always, right? Receiving the Holy Spirit inside is not always a feeling, it is a knowing. Because Jesus said, when we come into his presence, he will make us a new creation. So it's not about the feeling. Feeling is good. If you're singing worship song, Yeshu Masi, and your hair is standing, good. But that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, is something happening inside you? Is your spirit worshiping the Father in heaven? Are you growing in the Lord? You can play a keyboard and make it sound good. That's good. Anybody can make it sound good. It's good. God is calling us to worship in, in reverence and to have good instruments. All that is good. But if that is the focus, I become a big zero. The song is not going to matter. You understand what I'm saying? Right? So it's all in the spirit. The songs which makes your hair stand, it's good. Make it sit back and look to God. Make, make your spirit connect with the Holy Spirit. That is when the songs will touch your life, will minister to you. Right? So don't always wait for an angel to come. Don't always wait for fire from heaven. You can be just praying in your room and experience the presence of God. It could be a peace in your heart. It could be just a sense of comfort, a sense of joy. He can minister in that way. Right? So don't make it like, okay, this is how I have to do it. No. Don't put God in a box. Be open to the way the Holy Spirit works. Right? Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Okay, I'll read it. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, Peter is saying, we are born in the natural. The natural seed is corruptible. But you and I are born of seed that is incorruptible. The devil cannot come and tell you, hey, uh, you're a believer, no? So actually what happened was the sin that you did, there's no forgiveness. It's a worse sin. You cannot be forgiven. Now, Satan may come and say that. Right? He may come and corrupt our thoughts and our minds. But we are born of incorruptible seed. As believers, you tell the devil, devil, the blood of Jesus has paid the price. There is nothing that the blood cannot cleanse. Right? The Holy Spirit washes us. He removes the old. He regenerates us and he renews us. He gives us new strength. Right? When the doctors told me next six months you can't do anything, you you know, you can't play guitar because you have injected so many so much of needles, your fingers won't move are not moving. So you can't play guitar. After two months, I was playing in the church. He renews us. He renews our life. He strengthens us. How many of you know what the, the Bible verse which says the, uh, in, in Isaiah, he says he renews us like the strength of the eagles. Have you learned about the eagles? Do you know what the eagles do? They fly? Yeah, everyone knows eagles fly. What else? Sorry? Above, above the clouds, you're trying to say. Okay, good. Very good. Yeah. There are storms. Eagles fly above that. But let me tell you something about eagles. Eagles have a very interesting habit. When they are 40 years old, it's time for them, they have a choice. Right? So what they do is, eagles, they go into a lonely place and they start pulling off their feathers because they become very weak. They start pulling off their feathers. Very, very painful time. Imagine they with their own beak, they pull off their feathers. After they pull off their feathers, they're in extreme pain. Then they have their beak. The beak is old. It's going to crack anytime. 
So they break their beak on a rock. They break it. And it is so painful. But what happens? In a couple of months, the new feathers start coming. New beaks, uh, the new beak starts to grow. Now all of a sudden, this 40-year-old eagle will be like a young eagle. And it lives on for 40 more years. And that's why Jesus, God says, I will renew your strength like the eagles. You may be weary. You may be tired. There may be pain. But I will renew your strength. He'll take us through those painful seasons. But he will renew our strength. You know, the best part, I keep telling myself I'm an eagle. You know why? Because eagles, you don't see eagles sitting with crows. Do you see them? See the eagle and a crow sitting and talking to each other? Oh. God has called you to be an eagle. When the storm comes, you fly over the storm. God renews your strength. I keep telling myself, I'm an eagle. People will talk hundred, hundreds of things behind me. But I'm not a crow, I'm an eagle. And God will renew my strength. Amen? So you hold on to these verses. You're understanding scriptures. Okay. Look at, in the natural, okay, let's look at this example. In the natural, a, when a baby is born, they automatically inherit the genes of the parents. Now I'm talking about their inner self, right? Their, their, their cells. That is why children look like one of their parents or like both of them. They are a mix of both of them at times. Because they automatically get the genes of their parents, right? Now, over time, as the child grows, the parents, they, they incorporate the lifestyle of the parents, right? They incorporate. So, for example, a person is born in a rich family. Right? This young boy or the young child will have not many problems. He has a good life. And then if a child is born in the slums, going through a difficult childhood, they incorporate that. Right? You, you understand what I'm saying, right? So wherever we are, we incorporate that lifestyle. Now the Lord Jesus is saying, in the natural, it is so easy that we, you know, we, we walk in what, whatever in, in the family that we are growing in. So for example, me growing up, mediocre family. I had two brothers. I had a wonderful life, right? Wonderful childhood, enjoyed myself. We didn't know big luxurious things, right? We didn't have it. We didn't know it. We didn't want it. But we enjoyed life, right? Uh, and so we grew up in that way. Now, you may have another group of people who grew up very rich, right? They had everything with them. Good for them. So in the natural, it's like that. Same way, in the spiritual, the Lord Jesus is saying, I have brought you into his kingdom, right? So we are his children. We are in his kingdom. His genes or his DNA has already been put in us. His spirit has put, been put in us, but we must grow in the things of God. We must understand the things of grow in the knowledge of his will, grow in Christ likeness, grow in uh, prayer, worship, whatever we're doing, grow in it. The moment we become stagnant, you got to ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Am I here? Am I... Am I in a place? You know what happens to stagnant water? How many, you know what is stagnant? How many of you have seen a, uh, you know, a pond? You've seen a pond? A small you know, pond and there's water in that. What happens when you don't clean the pond? What happens if the fish will die? Okay. One, two, what will happen? If the fish die, what, what happens next? What? What happens to the pond? It starts to smell. Then what happens? The water becomes green color. And then what will come and sit on it? Flowers. What? Flies, mosquitoes, all kinds of insects will come and fly on. So, same analogy. Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from you. No pond. If in any way you feel that you're stagnant 
what's going to happen? The enemy is going to come. He's going to infiltrate. Sin is going to make our life miserable. So we've got to keep cleaning it up. Keep cleaning it up. Jesus said, rivers will flow from you. So how, do, how will the rivers flow? We've got to go back to the source. Go back to him. Draw from him every day. Learn to stay in his presence. The problem with young people nowadays, you know, as a pastor, people, a lot of young people come and speak to me. And they share their thoughts. And the first thing I ask them is, are you able to spend time in God's presence? They say, yes. How long? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Because I have other things to do. But they have a long list of prayer requests. Right? Ten minutes. Not more than that. Twenty minutes? No. Okay, maximum twenty minutes. Now, how will the rivers flow? How will God minister? We are not able to close the door and stay in His presence. Right? We have to cultivate the habit. If we don't have it, cultivate it. Learn to stay in His presence. Right? Initially, it may be hard, but it is number one. Number one priority. That's your foundation. Amen? Right? Stay in God's presence. So, spiritually, you and I, we have all the things, all the nature of God in us. All we have to do is to grow in it and walk in it. Right? Any questions? Are you with me? Are you understanding? All right, let's get into the next chapter. Any questions of those online? Uh, feel free to, like, you can ask your question. Okay. Chapter 11, because of him, you are in Christ. Okay, there's a question here. Can you post a link to the book about the Angola prison? Uh, uh, yeah, so, Sanjay, I'm not really sure. I, I remember reading this article, but I'll, I'll go back. I'll check on Google. Uh, I'll have to just check if it's one of the books that I've read. But if I get it, I'll definitely share the, uh, the link. Or uh, if it's available anywhere, I'll share the link to this place here. Yeah. How to increase time with God? Yeah. So, Daniel, the, the, most, the most efficient way of is to start small, right? So, one of the things that we can do is if you know once we become believers and we're still learning you know to 10 15 minutes start small right remember big toes open on small hinges right so start small the mistake that i made was i tried to start big 21 days fasting prayer it didn't work so you start small you you make small targets okay half an hour in the morning half an hour in the evening or before sleeping and then you can push up that half an hour. You can make it 45 minutes then make it one hour. And then over time, you will see that, OK, spending time in God's presence is it becomes a natural, right? So from one hour, it will go on. Like it can become one and a half hours. And so the important thing is to start small, right? Uh, there's a saying, right? If you want to uh, climb a mountain or conquer a mountain, the first step is important. I can't be on my bed lying down and looking at the mountain and saying, oh, man, one day I'm going to climb that mountain. There's no use. i got to take the first step. right? So, so Daniel, best way is to start small and stay true to that timing. And over time, you will be able to you know, spend more time in his presence. Yeah. So you can also break it up. If it's half an hour, uh, you can do you know, 20 minutes of uh, prayer and then 10 minutes of reading the word. and Or then you can do 20 minutes prayer, 10 minutes of just praying in tongues. Or 20 minutes prayer, 10 minutes just declaring uh, Bible verses. So you can mix it up, right? So it's, it doesn't have to be a, like a set way of, of spending time in God's presence. You see what works for you, right? All right. Let's go to uh, the next chapter. Uh, because of him, you are in Christ. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Let's read that. First Corinthians 1 and 30. But God has brought you into union with Jesus but Christ. Of him, and... You are in Christ Jesus, 
who become for wisdom from god and righteousness and first corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 yeah it's in your notes but of him you are in christ jesus who become for us wisdom from god and righteousness and sanctification and redemption yeah now this verse is a divine initiative and a divine action right what is the word divine divine is something holy which which god orchestrates right so look at that verse but but of him you are in christ jesus who became for us the wisdom of god right it is not who we became but who became for us you doing it for somebody else no it was somebody else doing it for you right and he became for us the wisdom of god and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that means what this whole event of the cross the whole plan that G, that god had about the cross was not because of us i mean it was not because we were uh, saying god do something no it is god's initiative god had decided that i will come into this world i live a holy life i'll die on the cross how do we know that scripture shows us right it says before the creation of the world before the foundation of the world we preach christ crucified so it is nothing that we did we didn't force god and say god please help us we didn't do that right but what, what it was god's initiative god saw our sins and he said i'm going to do it for the people right we didn't earn it we didn't deserve it we didn't even plan it god decided and he came and god brought us into union with christ god did it now all we have to do is believe that's our part but god has finished the work now if we don't believe what happens god's power still remains the same god's authority still remains the same god's victory is still the same the choice is up to us right but it's not our attempt if you see the old testament it was man's attempt to reach god right god said you you do all these sacrifices then i'll be okay with you but the cross is not our attempt it is god's attempt god said i will do it right this is present tense reality and this is a spiritual fact because from christ jesus what does it say the verse says we become the wisdom of god first one we become the wisdom of god do we have wisdom on our own maybe a little bit but we we become the wisdom of god which means the god's wisdom is made available to us you and i can walk in that wisdom if the devil comes with temptation god god's wisdom is in us we must know how to defeat and overcome temptation why because as believers god's wisdom is in us what's the second one christ is our righteousness what is righteousness we must know this by now right standing before god right so when jesus when god the father looks at us he looks at us with a right standing looks at us like as if this is jesus himself standing because when we become believers his righteousness comes into us is jesus afraid to go to the father so jesus i i'll meet you next week was he afraid was he nervous was he nervous when he when he saw the storm and said go father what to do now it was that his reaction when lazarus was dead was he afraid oh man he's dead four days what do i do no he knew that the father will listen to him 
He went with boldness. Now you and I have the righteousness of God because of Jesus. Same standing. Are you getting what I'm saying? Right? Same standing. So we can enter his presence with confidence. We have right standing. In the natural, now what the devil will do? You are useless. You don't know anything. You are, you know, I'm going to bring trouble upon you. You know, the more you pray, the more trouble I'll bring on you. Right? Where's your God now? Where is he? He's not helping you. you, know, you have You have gone through this challenges where is he i've taken you through so much of difficulty where is your god he's not there what is the use of believing in jesus what is the use of believing in god's word see all the problems that you're going through satan means accuser that's what he'll do he'll try to make us feel guilty and condemned but here the verse says we are the righteousness of God, right standing. Have I sinned? Yes. Have I done things which is uh, sinful in the eyes of God? Yes. But every time I enter his presence, I have a right standing before God. So they will say, you know, you can't go for prayer because you did something very wrong. Right? You did something wrong yesterday. How can you pray today? Then what do we do if we are not growing, if we are not matured in Christ, if we don't obey his word, what will happen? Oh yeah, I sinned. I did something very bad. I can't go into God's presence. And he'll keep us away. But the right understanding is you stand by your identity. Your identity is what? The righteousness of God. God will not push me away. People may push me away, but God will accept me. He will forgive me. Right? Next one, it says, we are the sanctification of God. That means God, how, you know, the Lord Jesus was sanctified. He was set apart for the work that he had to do at the cross. The same way you and I are set apart for the gospel of Jesus. They're set apart. The word sanctified means set apart as holy. So you and I, Set apart. When when God looks at us, He looks at us as His sheep, set apart for His purposes. We may be working in the corporate sector; we may not be in full time ministry, but we are set apart. And we need to walk in that way. I'm not a crow; I'm an eagle. You gotta tell yourself, I'm not a child of the enemy; I'm a child of God. I'm not working for the devil, but I'm working in God's kingdom. Sanctified, you're set apart. All my friends are doing something wrong, doesn't mean I will do. I'm separate. God has set me apart. Right? And the last one there is redemption. Christ is our redemption. We are redeemed, and the devil cannot violate that. Can the devil go back and say, okay, actually, the cross, you know, uh, Jesus took only few sins. Or the cross is it's only for the you know Jews. It's not for the Gentiles, it's not for the Indians. It is only for the Jews. Now he'll try to violate the power of the cross or the wisdom of the cross. But you and I as believers say, No, I am redeemed through the cross of Jesus Christ. I've been bought at a price. That is our standing. Now everything that we are learning, right? It's not on our, it's not, it's not something to just be here. It's not head knowledge. We must walk in it. Right? So I want to encourage each one of you, even as you're here, walk in this identity. Tell yourself, speak to yourself, and say, No, this is my identity in Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So we'll close and we will meet next week. Thank you so much to our online students. Uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead. God bless.